Okay. Friends, Austrians, fellow believers in a totally voluntary society. I've got a few things I want to say today about liberty through literature. I have a small ambition today. I want to kick off an entirely new libertarian liberty movement. So it's quite a small ambition. But before I do that, I'd just like to thank Professor Hopper and uh, Dr. Hopper, Frau Hopper, uh, for this wonderful conference here in, uh, here in Bodrum. So thank you for organizing the conference. Okay. <laughs> So the topic of my speech is liberty through, um, through literature, uh, and I've got a few things I want to talk about today. The first is a message. It's an ideological message, and here's the ideological message. We have won the ideological war. I think this year is a fantastic year, 2012. 1912, Ludwig von Mises um, puts out uh, a theory of money and credit. And over the next 100 years, we've gone on as an Austrian movement to win this ideological battle. So I'm going to take it as read that we have won the ideological battle. We just have a small problem, though. We have a room here with, a, with some people in it. We have a few islands around the world. We've got Auburn, Alabama. We've got wherever Doug Casey happens to be. Acapulco in Mexico. We've got a few islands of sanity, of, of reality, but the rest of the world is suffering from a mass Stockholm syndrome of believing in the state. But 99.9% of people believe in the state. So although we've won the ideological battle with fantastic books by Professor Hopper, by Murray Rothbard, by Ludwig von Mises, uh, Professor Salerno, and many other people, um, we still, we're only speaking to a very, very small section of society. So what I'd like to try and, and, and get going today is a movement where we move away from non-fiction books. We move away from arguing philosophy and history uh, and, and, and all those really important things. And some of us who aren't capable of doing that, who haven't, who haven't got the, the, the thinking power to do that, try another kind of writing, and that would be fiction writing. So as an experiment, I've actually, uh, a good friend of mine who's by the pool working on his tan at the moment has written, a very good close personal friend of mine, has written this book as an experiment. I thought I'd try an experiment and write um, a fiction novel myself to see if it's possible to create this new genre, which I'm going to call Rothbardian novels, but we might come up with a better name later, such as freedom novels or um, even laissez-faire novels, we could, we could even call these things, where we take the wonderful ideas of Mises and Rothbard and Hopper and we, we, we kind of embed them and, and insinuate them into fiction and into literature and try to persuade people to come to us um, through literature rather than through heavy-handed books. So um, many, many years ago, my first, uh, my first experience of Austrianism was by reading Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged. Now, a, a quite dense book, and they've got the four-hour John Galt speech at the end of the book. There was one word in it which, which brought me to the Austrian school, and that was Mises. It's mentioned once near the end of the book. And I just thought, who's this Mises character? And I got Mises' books out, and I went straight to Human Action. So my first Austrian book was Human Action, sort of going in right at the deep end. But how did I get there? I got there through reading Ayn Rand's um, Atlas Shrugged. So if, if some of us here can also write in that way, um, and we can, we can put our own ideas into our own novels, and we can create the kinds of things that people read on planes, on trains, and wherever they are, what, what do people do when, when they're on planes and trains? They're reading Kindles, and they're reading, they're escaping from this mad world that we live in by going into fiction, and by going into books, and by going into novels, and getting away from the madness that surrounds us all the rest of the time. It's their little island, and maybe if we can get into that island ourselves, then we can, we can help them, draw them to the non-fiction books, the, the human actions and the uh, man economies and states and democracy that got that failed, um, by, by writing really good fiction which, which draws them in in that particular way. Now, I just wanted to talk as well about the benefits of writing. For those of us here who, who aren't going to write a great Austrian um, uh, philosophy book, what are the benefits of writing if you actually go for this? The first thing you do is you'll create a, cre a, a creative milestone for yourself as an individual. So if Sean, you were to write a book, I'd love to see that book. I mean, it would be called The Singapore Trader or The, or the Expatriate. That would be a great title for a novel. What a fantastic idea that would be. I would love to read that book just by thinking of that idea. But if you did do that, that would be a creative milestone for you to, to create that idea. Um, there are some other benefits as well to doing this. Uh, one of the 
key things is you get a, you, you develop a sense of marketing. You develop a you develop a perpetual income stream. You, you can be anywhere in the world writing. You could be on a beach in Thailand writing uh, and selling your books and selling your ideas, moving around. You don't need to be tied into any one place. So if anywhere like the city of London goes down or wherever you happen to be goes down, you could always go somewhere else and still have this income stream going. I think that's a good thing as well. Um, the other thing as well is you, you could, um, your books could be taken into movies. They could be, if, they, if you're really successful, you can move into uh, doing screenplays. You can do all sorts of ideas, things tied to your work, tied to your novels. Um, which could enhance us as well and draw people into the Austrian school via your creative processes. Now, if anyone is interested in writing a novel, there is a process to it, which um, I applied, well, my friend, my good friend Jack England applied when he was writing this book here. Um, it's actually a, a lot easier than you think it would be. It's, it's the, the only thing it does require, though, is time and a commitment to doing it and completing the, the, the book. So the first part of the process is to take two ideas and bring them together. So you take one good idea, another good idea, you bring those two ideas together, and then you, you, you'll see the story in front of you, and then you basically work and chip away and create. The story is there already from these two ideas, and you, you chip away and you create the novel. Um, there's usually three drafting processes. So the first draft, you just write it out in, f in full without stopping. You just keep going, you keep writing, you don't stop. You don't correct, you don't go back. It, so if anyone here has ever tried, a novel, tried to write a novel or write a piece of fiction, what most people do is they get stuck and they go back and they try to rewrite it and rewrite it. But you mustn't do that when you're writing a novel. You must just go through the whole process from the start to the end and just get to the end. Then you do a rewrite process. Um, and then you probably need an editor as well to help you craft the, the book afterwards as well. So you need to get a trusted friend who can help you, um, who can help you create the novel. Now, the, the interesting thing after that is um, reading some of Jeff Tucker's work and James Alcher and Fred Reed on lourockwell.com. One thing we've got to get away from is going through the publishing industry, going through the mainstream media. Um, what will happen there is they tend to lock up your rights. They tend to uh, take your book ideas off you. They tend to lock them away. Um, they might publish you for a couple of years, and if, they, if you stop making the sales, they'll take your books off, off, wherever, off all the outlet streams. If you control your novels yourself, you publish them yourself, so something like Create Space, or you go through independent um, publishing, then keep control of the copyright, uh, and then market the things yourself, get marketing help in, uh, and then keep control of everything. And it'd be a really good exercise in um, learning how to market and learning how to push your ideas into the world. And again, helping you develop this, uh, this income stream and helping you um, take control of all of your work. The idea is that we, we try to use fiction to kind of capture the world one Kindle at a time. So if you take a random 100 people on trains and planes, if we can just get them to, to be reading your stuff, your fantastic work, on a Kindle, and then we can, through that fiction, through those ideas, we can direct them into these other greater books, the non-fiction books, the, the Man, Economy, and State, and so on, and Human Action, um, and using our, our new genre, our new kind of freedom novels genre. Now, there's been a problem in the past with something like, um, with Atlas Shrugged, uh, or with 1984, they're quite grim books. They're quite dystopian. I, th I think what we need to do, if we're going to go down this path as individuals, is write books which have hope in them. But too many of these books, like 1984, are very, uh, very unhopeful. We have Winston Smith at the end, um, loving Big Brother, and, and all those kinds of things. Um, with Atlas Shrugged as well, it was never really finished. John Galt's on a helicopter going to New York or Washington, and we <coughs> never ever see what happens next, because um, you get stuck because with Ayn Rand being a, a believer in the state, um, she got stuck. She, she couldn't say what John Galt would do to, to recover the world. But that's why she was maybe unable to, to write a sequel to that book and why many of her objectivist followers have been unable to write a sequel to that book. Because if you use the methods of the state, uh, then things are going to go wrong. So our books are going to um, have the ideas of freedom, complete freedom, 
and a complete voluntary society, but they'll be full of hope. They'll be full of um, forward thinking, optimism. And then hopefully people will be kind of um, switched on then to those ideas from, from, those, from those novels. So that's my kind of plan, um, is, is to try and encourage you to, help, to hopefully encourage you to, to write. If you can't write a really great Austrian non-fiction book, maybe to write a fiction book and to try to um, capture the world in that particular way. Um, okay, that, that's pretty much everything I've got to say, so thank you very much. By the way, there are copies of this available in the foyer. For... Yes, Kurt? You know, um, novels, uh, for someone of your character depth and whatever, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, a really sort of stick at something for a short story is usually how people get, um, short stories are also how people get uh, started in publishing books, right? And so you can write a short story through five pages. Yeah. So yeah, pe people can people can do whatever whatever the, whatever mechanism they they want to do. But I think with the, the Kindle experience, I think people want to get into a deep experience when they're reading. They want to lose the world and they want to go into a deep deep experience and and, and, and get carried away for you know eight, nine, ten, fifteen, twenty hours just to escape this this strange world that we live in. So I would think that maybe writing novels rather than short stories would be a good thing here. It, it is it is a hard piece of work. I mean to. To go along with a novel, you, it's probably going to take the first draft. It's probably going to take three months, um, and I always find that the, 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 one of the best ways of doing it is to it's, it's almost be in a dreamlike state, to let the unconscious part of your mind um, take over. So if we've got there's four parts of the mind, I'll just go through these now. So if we if we look at the brain, there are four thinking segments in the brain. Um, so the link there by the corpus callosum and the hippocampal commissure there. Uh, this is the left brain here. Uh, this is the right brain there. Uh, we've got the logic brain there. We've got the kind of creative mind there. We've got the kind of social brain here. And we've got the kind of doing things part of the brain there. And what we've got to do when you write is to, is to, is to link all four of these areas together and let them all come through. So to get to the to get to the the, the kind of creative bit, the, the best book I think is is by uh, Stephen King. It's on writing, and what Stephen King suggests is that when you're writing, you don't plan anything at all. You just let it come through the unconscious mind. So his technique is the first thing he does is he wakes up in the morning. He's in a kind of a dreamlike state. In his dreamlike state, he lets ideas flow from his unconscious. And then those unconscious ideas go onto the page. Then he moves, so that would be the, that's the kind of creative part of the brain, letting his unconscious flow through there. Um, later on, he applies logic to, to the books, and he, and he goes through and he adds color, and he adds sounds, and he adds, uh, he adds texture, and he adds a sense of time, and he adds various other things. Now, the, one of the best books for doing that, um, it's, it's, it's a bit cheesy, the title, it's How to Write a Damn Good Novel. It's by a guy called Ian Frey. So that would be a really good thing to, uh, another good book to get hold of if you really fancy kind of doing this huge creative thing, is get hold of that book too. So use the Stephen King book on writing to sort of format, ferment your ideas from your unconscious mind. Let them flood onto the page and then go through the second draft using the ideas in Ian Frey's um, bubble. This is the kind of thing that an editor would do as well. That, you know, this, this scene's in the wrong place, put it in this place. Uh, this character needs more development. Um, that kind of thing. Now the doing part of the brain, the, the brain here, this is the kind of rules following part of the brain. There's one essential book that everyone should get, uh, that's Strunk and White. Um, uh, it's, I think it's called Elements of Style. And that just tells you rules of grammar. So w w when you're writing from your unconscious in this half dream-like state, everything's rubbish. I mean, you, 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 all the commas are in the wrong places and the words are in the wrong places and so on. This book is brilliant, and its key phrase is omit needless words. So one thing you've got to do is be ruthless, absolutely ruthless, on, on cutting out stuff that's not necessary. In fact, you wouldn't, shouldn't even say not necessary, that's two words, you should say unnecessary. So you're constantly going through, looking for anywhere where you can shrink things down. So you don't say run quickly, you say sprint. Constantly shrinking ideas and phrases and words down. And then the, the, the bigger idea is putting the scenes in different orders and so on. 
Um, the final part of the, of the writing process is the social process here, which is in the kind of left, left lower limbic system here in the brain. Um, this is just by just talking to people. You must go out into the world and talk and, and relate to people and sit around pools late at night uh, talking to, uh, to Mr. Tucker about his bow ties and things. So that's, that's the thing that you do. That's the thing a lot of writers miss out. They just sit in a little room with a Venetian blind down and they, 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 they start writing fiction. It gets uh, too insular. So go out into the world, meet people and talk. Um, use the, read Stephen King's book, write. He will help you unlock your mind and unlock your thinking uh, and, and let you get your unconscious mind onto the page. Then use Ian Frey's book to, uh, called How to Write a Damn Good Novel to add all the things in your text which is missing. Color, sound, sense of smell. I mean, I'm very bad at the sense of smell. I, 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 I don't have a nose in my brain. There's, there's nothing there. And I have to go through and, and, and add, you know, add things. You know, she smelled of lavender and... Uh, uh, she smelled of lilies. I don't know why I'm talking about women and what they smell of, but you know, the, when a soldier's on a battlement and he's about to be killed by the Persians, he, you know, there's all sorts of other smells you, you can introduce there. So I have to, I have to manually add those in. Um, and then go through the strunk and white elements of style and punch up that grammar and just really tighten all that stuff together. And if you go through these four processes in the brain and talk to people here as well, then what you create is a really rich, deep, full kind of text, uh, which, uh, which has a lot of three-dimensional or four-dimensionality to it. You must add time, a sense of time to things as well. So I, I think a novel is, is the best way to go, rather than short stories. I think it, uh, it, it's, it's a deeper experience. For, I mean, we're trying to capture the world one Kindle at a time. So we need to get people really into the Kindle uh, that they're reading on to, to really capture their attention. And if we can just slip in a few few key phrases every now and again, and we can pull them along. Yes? Can I ask you what your position is on private property, sorry, on intellectual property? Uh, and depending on your answer, whether you're a Kinsellan or a Randite, how do you, how do they offer get paid if you avoid the... Yes, it's, it's a really interesting question. I mean, I'm, sorry? Uh, the question was, uh, what's, my, what's my standing on intellectual property? Am I a Kinsellian or a Randian? I'm very much a Kinsellian. Mm -hmm. That's another reason why I, th I think we should go down the independent um, publishing route ourselves. Through all these wonderful technologies we've got, if you just look up on Fred Reed's articles on, on Lou Rockwell, or you look at uh, James Alch's articles on, on his blog site, uh, you'll find all sorts of um, really good, long, deep articles about self-publishing, about keeping control of your own stuff. And the reason for that is to not let the publisher have the copyright, because if the publisher gets the copyright, first of all, they'll give you a pittance. They won't market you unless you're famous. Um, so they, only, they do two things. They get you into bookstores, and then they do a nice cover. Everything else is down to you. So if you can, if you can get yourself onto Amazon and, and various other outlets, and you can... Um, get yourself a nice cover, pay someone a few hundred dollars to give you a nice cover, or do it yourself, then you've done everything the publisher's going to do for you. And the problem with publishers is they will just pull your books off their bookshelves if it's not making enough money. If you do it yourself, you can sell your stuff forever, and then you can hand that on. As to the uh, copyright thing itself, I think what we have to do is we have to make it so attractive and, and so reasonably priced that no one needs to, to copy it or whatever. So. Um, make your prices, that's why Kindle is such a good thing, because you can charge, you know, $1.99, $2.99. You're not having to charge somebody $14.99. So just make it so distributable and so cheap that it, it's good the way you give it to them. They don't need to go anywhere else. They don't need to go to Pirate Bay or anywhere else and download illicit PDFs, uh, illicit according to the state. So I'm very much a Kinzelian there. And I don't think losing intellectual property uh, prevents us from creating, in fact, I think it will create more stuff, because if you look at music in England, um, co uh, classical music in English, England died because of copyright. That's why the, the only English composers we can think of were usually people from Germany who moved to England, like Handel. So all the Ger Germany was fantastic, because there was hundreds of Germanies. There was no copyright, so you got, you got Beethoven, you got Mozart, you got all these wonderful, wonderful classical um, musicians, because there was no copyright. So I don't think that we would have a problem with losing copyright, I think it would actually be more creative. And then I could, if Sean wrote the fantastic book uh, about the Singapore trader, I could even take, I could even write the sequel to it if he didn't, with, you know, without intellectual property. Or if, uh, or if Vincent, where's Vincent? where's Vincent? If Vincent wrote The Accidental Belgian, which I would love to read, 
you know, I could help him with that, or I could take it on and I could extend it. Uh, or if Sandro, Sandro, where are you? The Life and Loves of a Perpetual Traveller. I mean, what a book that would be. I'd love to see that book. I, w I want to read it right now. You know, and without intellectual property, fine, he writes it, he, he does it, distributes it in a way that I don't need to go and steal it off, par steal it off Pirate Bay. Uh, and I think things will be more creative, like German classical music. Jeffrey. Thank you for your comments about copyright. <coughs> One point of clarification, though, uh, more recently, authors have become aware of what an evil scam, you know, copyright is. Yeah. And when they have a book picked up by a publisher, they'll insist on retaining the copyright, as you suggest. Yeah. And then only to discover later that they've signed a contract that says that they, in fact, they only control the rights of the book once the publisher takes it out of print. Yeah. Which never happens at all. Yeah. I mean, so you will not uh, regain the rights to your own work 70 years after you're dead. Yeah. When everyone else can get it as well. Which is an amazing thing. So it's not enough to retain your copyrights. You, have to, you, can't, you can't sign the contracts. That's, that's the key that's thing. Yeah. So, uh, yes, independent publishers and self publishing, and publishing into the, into the commons, yeah. to create the commons in a way. In other words, not so much to retain the copyright of yourself, but, but make it part of the commons so that you, in fact, share your work with everybody in the market well. There's also a widespread confusion that somehow, um, the commercial ethos is compatible with copyright, whereas publishing the commons is somehow just dumping your work on, on the world and never getting paid. And, and that's just wrong. Yeah. Which I think you applied in your view. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm not a Kinsellian, I'm, I'm a Tucker, Tuckerian, if there's such a thing exists. <laughs> okay.